enrolled in this program. I think there's only 11 results so far in this. Those have been cracked out. Frank, yours are going to be uh, to you this afternoon. We've got it cracked out. I'll get the information. But not everybody's on here. But if you look, we've ranged from 9% on a Monterey. Pretty heavy. And interesting, a lot, enough, the Monterey Nonpareil at uh, 14 had the huge numbers of naval orange were made going, uh, during the summer. It also had the highest level of mummy counts that we could tell during that dormant period. So that's an orchard that we need to talk talk with your PCA and the farmer that farms that and approach and bringing this down. Otherwise, I'm honestly I'm real happy with uh, what have been what's been done here. The one thing that I have recognized and again walking through the orchards is many of these did have quite a few mummies on, and you will be fighting naval orange worm. Now you can fight it chemically, at least in the short term. But uh, four and a half, five percent damage, you're probably going to be uh, looking at at least two specific sprays for naval orange worm, probably in May, another one in hull split, uh, and maybe even uh, more on top of that. One thing to remember when you do a sanitation <laughs> job that brings it down to two mummies per tree, you reduce that. Pop, uh, damage from naval orange worm by 80 percent. With a single spray you reduce naval orange worm by 50 percent. So um, I, I want you to keep that in mind. That's pretty much summarized over a number of years work and is in this uh, uh, pest management manual for that. Yes? I didn't hear what you said. Sanitation is what percent? 80 percent. And single spray is, 20, is 50 percent. That's on average. But I've never seen where you've had a population of greater than 3%, better than 60% with the best timing for a chemical spray. I've, go ahead. I was going to ask if the hard shell or soft shell has any... Oh yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> absolutely. I'm talking... When I'm giving these figures, I'm really glad you bring that out because I tend <coughs> to forget this. When I'm giving these figures, I'm talking primarily soft shell varieties. Certainly, if you've got the late Fritz and Monterey, you're going to exacerbate the problem. But basically, I'm talking about those damage levels and as non pareils in the old days, it used to be Merced's as well. Um, hard shells, you've got a lot more leeway in terms of infestation from insects and uh, can avoid a lot of the unnecessary, or not unnecessary, but multiple sprays. Probably most of the hard shells in here this year could have gone without a, an insecticide for twig borer oriental fruit or naval orange worm, excuse me. It's a different issue with uh, diseases, however. Sir? Yes. No, I didn't get a lot. If I've got more mummies in, say, the hard shells, yes. is that still an overwintering problem? Yes. Okay. It's not as severe as I, you. There. Okay. There. Certainly the level of mummies impacts the population within the orchard. The next thing that comes into play with both hard shells and the, and, uh, the soft shell varieties is um, how well that shell is actually sealed. Okay, let me explain this. For nonpareil, you'll have varying gradations of seal. This year our seal was excellent on nonpareil, and I think that accounts for a lot of the reduced damage that we've seen. But the same plays for the hard shell varieties, as in, particularly in low yield years when your nut meat itself expands and causes that shell to split. Then you're much more susceptible to damage in a, in a hard shell variety. And probably need to talk to you a little more on this, but I'll be happy to do that after, after this here. But hard shells in terms of your own orchard, uh, the sanitation isn't nearly as important as it is on nonpareil fritz in Monterey. Your neighbors may disagree and you will get survival of the worm between the hull and the shell. They just won't get into the meat. So, do any of you want to question what's on this sheet? I don't know how many of you have gotten your reports back from your own processors if you want to ask any questions about uh, damage. Uh, only had one 
orchard so far that I felt was severely impacted. I think we can overcome that next year, but I hated to see it. The rest are looking pretty good. Okay. Next thing I want you to look at is just, this is just um, something you can take back and look at it yourself is uh, when you get home. It's just a progression of, of egg deposition by navel orange worm. This is the average of the 13 orchards. So we've taken counts weekly through these orchards. I think we had three or four traps per orchard. Went through each week, counted them. And where you see a high point, it means there are a lot of eggs being laid. Where you see a low point, it usually means the generation is turning. It's a poor time to spray. And, and really, this is the kind of information we use more to time sprays than we use to <coughs> determine your, uh, the, uh, the necessity of a spray. And your May sprays, in this year would have been the late part of May, uh, early part of June, occurring somewhere between May 25th and June 8th, were effective timings in those May sprays. One thing on the May sprays that you're doing, you're controlling both twig bore and navel orange worm. You can use uh, either the navel orange worm timing or the May spray uh, or the twig bore degree day model to make that timing. But if you go in with May, I just want you to make sure that you don't go in with a pyrethroid because that will really exacerbate. I know it's cheap, it's hard to argue that, but at that timing you're going to be putting on two miticides and sometimes even three miticides, even if you've used the agrimec during that early period. So if you're going in at May, I'd stay away from the pyrethroids. Um, uh, the whole split period, you've got a little bit more leeway, and in that particular timing, it would have been about, uh, oh, we had initiation of hull split at uh, July 20th, and that would have been a very effective spray for your hull split plant. As far as um, monitoring the naval orange worm, um, would it be worth my while to buy the pheromone, to try to get that pheromone? Or is that not very good, or is it not available to the regular? I don't have a lot of confidence in the pheromone right now. And that the pheromone is the compound that actually attracts the male moth. So it's attracted to a trap. And we, under a, a very, I, I wouldn't do that. I think the egg laying traps, I mean, you can see good demarcation of the oval position here. That's also closer to the stage that is you're trying to kill. We're not trying to kill the moths, we're trying to kill the larvae. So I, I personally like the egg traps myself, and I know it's kind of old school, um, uh, but the pheromone for navel orange worm just isn't really stable. Some people have had luck with it. Uh, I'd prefer to go with the egg traps. So I just wanted to just give you this quick summary, get an idea here. The first uh, period of emergence from late April, drops down into the middle of, of June, and then we pick up quite quickly again in late June and drop down into the early part of August, and then this third peak is what you're trying to avoid with early harvest. If you've got control over your harvest, that's very important to try to avoid. If there's any way you can get in and get those nuts off the tree, then moth won't lay the eggs on nuts that are on the ground, or at least a substantial. Okay, and we're going to go into the orchard, but I'm going to start passing some of these twigs around. I want each of you to maybe take them. I hope I've got enough. There's even going to be some on here. Gina? Okay. 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 So I don't uh, run out on that side. Why don't you pass these? Remember, now if you're going to make a dormant, uh, oh, you've got one. Okay, if you're going to be making a dormant disease spray, everybody's good here, then, then maybe this isn't as important. The point I'm trying to make, the sampling that I was to discuss here, I'm, I know I'm moving around a lot. That's okay. You're going to get people thrown up when they watch this. Right. You know? So, everybody got one? 
Okay. Uh, the real reason that we've gone through in the past uh, as a dormant insect control has been for San Jose scale, European red mite, both of which are controlled with oil alone. San Jose scale, European red mite, brown almond mite to some extent. Those three uh, arthropods, two mites and one insect, are controlled by oil alone. Peach twig borer is not controlled by oil alone. It either needs uh, um, old days a broad spectrum material that would control it. Now we've got the more selective demolin that actually penetrates and affects the molten. We found, and I want to give Lonnie Hendricks credit on this, uh, David's predecessor. He really brought to the forefront that, that said, listen, you know, I don't think we need to continue to make these dormant sprays and almonds. It's not like uh, nectarines, it's not like pears, it's not like apples, where that spray needs to be on before the insects move to the fruit. He got people through the initial BIOS, BIOS program to begin, begin questioning that. And the no, use of dormant sprays for insects has dropped. Now, keep this in mind. We're talking dormant sprays on one hand for insects and dormant sprays for diseases. You can combine the two. David was talking the disease issue. I'm now talking on the insect issue. And I want you to just be sure of that. If you do not have San Jose scale in your orchard, you can control twig borer and mites during that late bloom pe period. The products that you have, you mean late they are dormant. Late dormant? Yeah, okay. the, the late dormant or, or bloom period. Okay. okay, instead of going in the dormant period, and you're not making a disease spray, you're going to save yourself a whole run through your orchard with a spray and expense by making those bloom time sprays and including uh, 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 some of the non materials non-toxic to bees. Those include demolin, those include Bacillus thuringiensis, BTs, Dipel is one, Javelin is another, Certus has one, Agree I think is the name of it. Um, thanks. And um, and Intrepid is, is a third. So there's a, a group of materials that don't kill bees, there's stomach poison that will kill that small twig bore coming out of the hibernaculum. The beauty of that is that there's very little leaf surface on that twig and the small worm coming out has to do a lot of feeding at that time and with those toxicants on there, they're very, very effective. I, I would say of the materials, I think Demolin is probably your most effective single spray, but it's also a lot more expensive than I... Now, you can't do that with a pyrethroid because of the toxicity to the bees. So, from the insect standpoint, you can, by looking for scale, you can make that decision whether you're going to go on dormant or bloom. Now, I want you to look at the wood that you've got. And you're going to see some things that do look like scab, and scab and scale can be mistaken just by trying to the scab on the greener part of the tissue you'll see little brown spots on here you you scrape that and and there's it really is clean below, below that wood but if you look at the little areas where you see little gray dots with red circles think of it as a brown trout Okay, think of this as a brown trout. There's a single dot with a red circle around it, all right, on its side. That's what scale looks like on this wood. And that's, you don't have to count this. You just have to be able to recognize this. And if you've got, you go through, you just walk through your orchard right now, randomly pick 100 of those, and if you've got 20 of those that have any level of scale, you should put an oil on you should put an oil on. Now that scale isn't going to infest the nut, but it will kill the spurs that the nut is produced on. And an oil at that time is the most effective way of controlling spur, uh, San Jose scale so it doesn't feed on the spur growth. You will also sm smother the egg stage of European red mite and brown almond mite. 
You will not control web spinning mites. Those are either deep under the bark or wintering at the base of the tree on the ground. Those you will not control. Those other three you will, yes. Uh, 20, uh, 20, if you're taking 100 twigs, how many acres out of, out of that? Um, you know, yeah, I'm using that as a general uh, term. We I have on a forty blocks. on a okay on a forty acre block, I would make uh, four stocks and look at. I if I was a PCI, I'd be looking at two hundred twigs and four stocks. Okay. Okay. But you're gonna, you know, you're gonna recognize this in a hurry. It, like so many things in life, you either have very little and you can pick this up early, or you have a lot and you can pick this up early. That number in between where you've got maybe 10 or 15, then you may have to look a little off, more often. But what you really want to do is pick up if you've got a lot. We did a, a project in Kern with Mario Viveros where we left um, oil out of any of the sprays and we actually included a broad, we were using Guthine at that time. So we didn't do any dormant sprays but we uh, included a Guthion hull split spray, which is pretty toxic to the parasites. And we actually, within three years, killed 20% of the wood in that, tree, in, in that orchard. Now, the grower went out of business, but... Uh, no. <laughs> well, you're not helping. No. <laughs> and I came up to Kearney, but Mario had to... Do, no, honestly, but it was on a small test site that we were identifying. CAL can move in a hurry if you're relying on products like Lorsban, Imidan, uh, Guthai. Not to say that I'm not trying to move you completely away from those, but if you're not, a, if you're using those and not including a dormant spray, you're going to get in a problem with San Jose scale eventually. There are a lot of very effective parasites and predators of scale that under a more soft, non-disruptive program don't allow scale to get as established. And as I say, in, in wal almonds, you can take a lot more scale than you can in the deciduous trees. So, have you have you looked at this? Were you able to see the scale on here? This is a really good example. It almost looks like somebody hit a cigarette ash on the top of these, a little gray spot. But when they feed, I, the, the second growth stage, it's a very small insect. If you look at this with a hand lens, you're actually going to see a little gray or black cap in there. So I'll let you take a look at this and I'll pass this hand lens around if I can keep from choking myself. Here's another one too, Walt. You want me to pass this around? Oh, yeah, yeah, Here, please. I'll go, I'll go this. Okay, and just focus in and out. Just hold one of them steady and move the other one until it comes into focus. So you either hold the hand lens steady or move it and hold the twig steady. But look, and right at the center of that little red circle, you're going to see a little gray dot. And if you pop that off, there's a little deflated football under there. And if you start moving that with your knife blade, you'll see a little hair, a little hair that just sticks right into the wood. And you can't knock that scale off because she's got her uh, mouth part stuck right into the wood. So that's the key that I want you to be able to recognize for scale. Give you a minute or two to do that, and then I'll just go out. I mean, there's no secret. You just walk out, four or five uh, trees here, pull a, a spur or a shoot. I've taken this new growth because last year, the, the majority of scale is on the old wood, and it moves out during the spring onto the new growth. And it's really easy to see on that green new growth. So that's why I've chosen this. I mean, if you look at the deeper bark, there'll be scale there, but you're not going to see it nearly as clearly as you do here. Hey, well, does it yeah. tend to be in the center of the tree or up at the top? You know, um, it depends a little on what your approach. If I've always, con your highest population where the wood is the roughest towards the interior part of the tree. I see more on the center of the tree unless a guy's been on a religious dormant spray and then you're going to get it where you don't get the, uh, as good a coverage. The guy's been on a very thorough dormant spray, you're probably going to see uh, more at the top of the tree, but in uh, an orchard like this you'll see it building from the, the lower part and then moving out. 
You want to go out and just we'll show you what this looks like in sampling?